We're talking about gravity and orbits and satellites. And we also have to do some derivations. But at least the derivations are going to be about awesome things like escape speed so you can leave the planet Earth to go somewhere more, well, I don't know, more awesome, but exciting like Mars. And we'll also talk about deriving Kepler's third law. Buckle up. Let's say that you want to fire a cannonball so fast up in the air that it never comes back. And we're not talking just that you're going to send it into orbit. You're going to send it out into the depths of the solar system so it keeps trucking and trucking forever, like the Voyager space probe. That is what we call giving it the escape speed from the planet. So let's say that you've got a planet, which I happen to here, called Planet Disco Ball, and you want to send something so that it never comes back. You're going to need to give it uh, enough energy so that its GPE that you see here uh, becomes all the way zero. Because if you have any less than that, then the force of gravity is going to grab onto it and it's going to pull it back down. Now you can't actually get it infinitely far away, but you can give it enough energy that the force of gravity has weakened by the time it gets to whatever distance it is, and it still has enough kinetic energy that will keep going and going and going. So we're going to learn how to derive the value for escape velocity from a planet. Now this is a derivation, but I will try and make it suck less than most derivations. If you want to send something on an escape speed so that it never ever comes back to your planet of choice, then you're going to have to give it a gravitational potential energy at a distance infinitely far away, so it's going to have zero gravitational potential energy eventually. So what you need to do is this. It must barely have enough kinetic energy to reach that infinitely far GPE and have zero left over. Now we can do this without too much problem if we start with the conservation of energy. And you should know that that always starts with initial equals final, where this initial is going to be at the surface of your planet, where you are launching your space probe from. Finally, at the end, it's going to be infinitely far away. And so you're going to start with your GPE initial plus your kinetic energy initial. And you're going to end up with the same thing, GPE finally plus kinetic energy finally. Now it gets easy here because way out here, infinitely far away, zero GPE. If you're going to give it just enough energy so it just barely is coming almost to a stop infinitely far away, that's kinetic energy of zero. Now your GPE originally is going to be minus capital G M M over R. That's your radius of the planet. And that's minus, by the way, plus your normal one-half mv squared equals zero. Now, you just solve for velocity. Presto! I skipped ahead, and I went ahead and solved for velocity, and you end up with this not too difficult equation, where this is big G, mass of your planet, radius of your planet, and keep in mind that for Earth, this is 11.2 kilometers per second, and also keep in mind it doesn't matter what mass of your object you have, it's the exact same escape speed, now this is for ballistic things that you launch with an initial speed and then they're projectiles. This is not for things like rockets which will have a continual thrust to fight against the force of gravity. Those do not have as high of an escape speed because of that thrust that they have. Now the fact that gravity provides the centripetal force for circular motion probably is obvious if you've made it this far in higher level physics. But just to maybe restate the obvious, if you've got your International Space Station or Hubble Space Telescope, whatever is going on in low Earth orbit, which is actually even closer to the Earth than this, you are going to have a very massive force of gravity on it that keeps it in circular motion. Now, the if something is geostationary or geosynchronous, and it's way out here at this orbit, which is not to scale, it should be even farther, maybe, I think, seven Earth radii out. Because it's farther away, Let's say it's of the same, if this is mass m, this is mass m, it would have a much smaller 
force of gravity on it because it is farther out. But keep in mind, satellites, as they go around, they have very small rockets on them to adjust their orbits slightly, but for the most part, they're just acting under the force of, force of gravity only. We're going to derive Kepler's third law. Kepler, in the years pre-Isaac Newton, before they knew anything about the universal law of gravity, Kepler worked for Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe was an astronomer who had no nose. He wore like a brass, gold, silverish metal nose in public. Uh, but he made lots of observations. Kepler took Tycho Brahe's observations and came up with a pretty cool party trick. He said that if you took the period of any planet, squared it, and put it over the distance of that planet from the sun and cubed it, that equaled a constant. And you could do that for any planet. So let's say that you had one planet, let's say Venus, and you had this, it would equal to another planet, let's say Mars, with this same crazy ratio between the period and their distance from the sun. Now you can prove Kepler's third law uh, via Newton's second law, and I'll show you how. Now for any planet, let's say you start with Newton's second law, and that is F equals MA. Knowing that we're going to use Newton's universal law of gravitation and circular motion, see what you can substitute in here for force and acceleration that's going to eventually leave us only with period and radius. Pause it, see what you can do. Hopefully, you filled in Newton's universal law of gravitation, which is this, and you also knew that for circular motion, A equals B squared over R, and you ended up with this. Now, it's also nice to realize that velocity is going to equal to circumference divided by the period for circular motion. And so v squared is going to equal this 4 pi squared r squared divided by t squared. Plug that in. See what sort of awesomeness happens. I'll tell you what happens. A lot of crap cancels out, such as the mass of the object in orbit, or the planet in orbit, and some of the distances away from the sun. And you end up with this situation being equal to this whole thing, which is a constant. We can call that constant z. Now, if you want that to look nicer and invert it, you can do that. I don't care. And you'll end up with another constant, which maybe we can call k. There you go. That's Kepler's third law, proven just like that.